So welcome everyone to the fifth lecture on deep learning for NLP. Today we are going to cover the convolutional neural network approach, which is like a quite easy and quite powerful model. Are there any open questions from last time, last week in general? Anything in mind? Okay, no open question. In case you have any open questions, uh, feel free to raise your hands during the presentation. And today I'm going to present, as mentioned, the convolutional neural networks who read some recent papers may might have heard about them. Um, some recommended readings. So there's a YouTube video. There's a paper from Kim and there's also um, from the CS uh, Stanford class 231 a uh, nice, nice write-up about convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks are quite universal ar architecture, is uh, achieving state-of-the-art performance in many tasks. Um, this is a table from Kim, performance on sentence classification tasks. So he worked on sentence classification. Um, today we will mainly talk about sentence classification. And he trained a uh, Convolutional Neural Network, CNN, on different data sets. MR are movie reviews, so positive, negative. Then the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. So this is fine grain, this is coarse grain. And then some others on subjectivity, T-Rec, I think it's classification of questions into different categories. And as you see, it's, it achieves quite good performance. Um, so, for example, on sentiments classification, on new reviews, 81F uh, measure, and on s the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, it achieves 48 on the fine grain, and 87 um, on the coarse grain, where it's only positive or negative. And last week we had the recursive autoencoder by Zoha and also the re recursive neural tensor networks, which is like a bit advanced. Pro uh, proposal from Zoha, which is yeah, a bit a bit worse. So it achieves the recursive autoencoder seventy seven percent on the um, movie reviews and eighty two percent on the uh, sentiment tree, uh, Stanford sentiment tree bank. Uh, you have to be careful when you watch these numbers um, because so this paper was proposed in two thousand fourteen. The Zoha papers are from two thousand eleven and two thousand. 13 and the field advanced quite fast and you cannot be sure is this model proposed by Kim uh, better from the architecture point or is he just using better optimization so for example he uses dropout <coughs> in his um, in his architecture where he states that the dropout increases the performance between 2 and 4 percent F measure and in the Zoha paper uh, dropout was not invented yet or not detected yet and it would be like interesting how do these models by Zoha, which we covered last week, like the recursive tree models, uh, when you also implement um, dropout. But the paper by Kim is really nice because it's really easy to understand. It's kind of straightforward to implement with some some yeah some tricks you need to know, and it's quite easy to 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 use it for a wide range of tasks. Um, some notes on convolutional neural networks. Um, convolutional neural networks are dominating computer vision. So computer vision, as soon as you go into computer vision, you will read about uh, convolutional neural networks and they mainly only use con uh, convolutional neural networks. In NLP, uh, I would say they became popular in around 2014, uh, something like that. You find the first papers on that in 2014, 2015 which applied convolutional networks, which is not so long. So in computer vision, there's one paper, Linet, from 90, I think 96, uh, where they already implemented and used it, and in MLP, now they became popular last year, this year. And when you search on Google or read publications on that or books on that, you often people explain convolutional networks in computer vision and images are typically three-dimensional so you have a width you have a height and you have the color for the three dimensions and in NLP we have only one dimensional data so for example our sentence the words in the sentence or the word 
in the documents, the notation for one-dimensional data is much simpler as three-dimensional. And also, when you think in your head, uh, dealing with one-dimensional data is much easier than three-dimensional data because for the convolutional layer, we will introduce uh, like one or two more dimensions. And then we have for images like four or fifth dimensional and I personally not really able to think in a fifth dimensional space. So it's really complicated when you read it in computer vision. So luckily for us, we have only like one dimensional data. So we have only to think of in two or three dimensions, which is quite okay. Um, convolutional neural networks solve two crucial challenges. The first challenge is that we have in NLP um, variable sized input data. So for example, we have a sentence or we have a document. And as you know, every sentence is can have a different length and we cannot ensure that all, every sentence has like 10 words. And in our network or what we had so far is typically we needed some fixed sizes. So we could use like the recursive approach from last week uh, to deal with variable sizes or also um, other approaches by Colobert, the window approach where we only, when we want to tag, for example, named entity where we only let took a uh, look at the towards to the left and towards to the right and say, okay, this is our fixed size input. But dealing with variable sized um, documents, input data, input streams is not so simple. Second challenge we have is like, uh, so for example, when we have the window approach from Colobert and we increase the window size, so we not only take two words to the left and two words to the right, but we take like 10 words to the left and 10 words to the right. Um, this allows us to capture more context, but it increases also the number of parameters. So when we double the size of our context window, for example, we double the number of parameters or even increase it further. And often the position in the context window is, is not so important. So for example, when we do semantic row labeling or semantic argument labeling, and we have the sentence, uh, Jim sells his car for $5,000 and we want to label $5,000 here. What's the semantic argument? It's not so important how many words and which words are in between here. So when we have the sentence, Jim sells his car, which he inherited from his dad for $5,000, it's not so important that a lot of words are in between there. Then, and in the window approach, here we would need like a really long window to be able to keep the crucial information that sales refers or that the $5,000 refers to sales to have this information in the window. Okay, so we start really simple with a single layer uh, convolutional neural network which applies only a single filter. Um, there are a lot of terminology which will we discuss and which will be covered. So in case you're confused, uh, and what's the meaning of filter length and stride and so on, uh, just raise your hand. It took me also a while to, to get all uh, the terminology correct. Um, so we have a sentence, the movie was awesome, and we have some padding, padding to the left, padding to the right. Um, and what we have is our word vectors, for example, we're trained with word to vec or randomly initialized. We have a weight matrix W, and we have a bias B. So the word vectors uh, are two-dimensional and we have like the target work, the, and then we take one word to the left and one word to the right and we compute like a single forward information. So we take our weight matrix W, multiply it by <coughs> W1, W2, W3, so word one, word two, word three, add the bias vector B and crunch it through some activation function so you can use any activation function you want to use. So I use the tangent hyperbolical in this case, and this gives our output. So in this example, arbitrary example, the output could be 0.8. So this is a single filter applied on a single word. And what we can do is now to compute it on every word. So we take every word, apply the same operation, and then we get some output. So um, here we get when the is a target word, we take 
or get the output 0.5 when movie is the target word we get the output 0.2 0.6 and 0.9 for was and awesome as a target word and so for like a four word sentence we get four output values uh, so the window size in this case is three so like this is three you can also choose other window sizes you can all choose window size one where you only take this one or you could say okay I take window size five where I take two to the left and two to the right and the target word What's important, these numbers here are all computed with the same weight matrix and all with the same bias matrix, uh, bias vector. So is this simple step clear to everyone? The difference between feed forward is just a window, Correct, so it's like a feed forward. You take the window, and you apply it to every like three words you have. And then you get, when you have four word sentence, you get like also four digits for the output. So this is nothing special, uh, which we already implemented or applied in the word, or in the Senna model where we did named entity recognition, where we then classified directly on the output. Is it like a city name? Is it a person name or is it whatever company name. So what's now important is we have now these four digits. So what, when it would be like a 10 word sentence, we would have 10 sentences, uh, 10, 10 output values. What we do next is to apply a pooling layer. And um, the idea of a pooling layer, layer is that you capture the most important activation. So you have a really long sentence so let's say you have a long sentence how a movie, movie was and you want to know is it positive review or, or negative review and I'm not really interested in the first words so I'm not really interested in the words the and movie and was but the word awesome is quite important for uh, sentiment classification and in the pooling layer you capture the most important activation so we say okay let's have our different outputs from the filter and we compute the max over time we just take the maximum of all the outputs of all the activations and because of the max over time pooling the length of the input sequence is ir irrelevant if we have four words four words we still get a single number if we have 1000 words we still get a single number uh, out of the max pooling layer um, so in this case, we just compute the convolution, the filter, we get four digits, and then we apply the max, so the max would be 0.9. And if you add further words to the sentence, the uh, maximum could still be 0.9. Yes, question? Yeah, so uh, you, the way you kind of describe this makes it sound like, well, so due to the task, um, the sentiment classification is awesome is the word that we really care about. And then this also happens to be the, 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 the max the, uh, here at the point nine. Yeah, do those two go together, or maybe those two be um, random? I mean, did you is is it on purpose that the point nine is supposed to be awesome? Or? Mm -hmm. So in this example, it's on purpose. And uh, what we would start with in a convolutional neural network is that in the first run, when you did not train it, it would look totally random. The, the, send, uh, the, the output, but over time when you train it, the uh, classifier, your convolutional network will learn what are like important words or what are important context windows. So for example, when you have not awesome, it will detect, okay, not awesome is something different than awesome and will apply a different um, activation value to it. Okay, so we've already, we've already detected that and that's why we're doing Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the max gives gives you like one one output, one fixed sized output for a variable length input, and you can just forward it to a soft max classifier and derive, for example, a sentiment class for the sentence. Um, max pooling is most common in NLP and computer vision. You see also min pooling or mean pooling. So max pooling or min pooling is really similar. I mean, you just change the signs. Mean pooling, where you compute the mean. 
overall these values I think it's not so so common and not so useful in NLP so in NLP it's mainly you use max pooling computer vision you can also vary a bit what you compute maybe you can compute mean you can min which gives you different output information a small excursion to max pooling computer vision so in computer vision and also when you compute computer w uh, literature on computer vision you often pool over a fixed size window so for example about over a two times two window so here you have your different pixels and the different activation you got from the filter stage from the convolutional stage so here you have an output one one five six and then you go with like a two times two window and see what's the maximum value on these two times two value uh, window so it's a six and then you go with the window here at, or again with like a two times two window you go <coughs> for value eight value three and value four and this in computer vision gives you down sampling so you have for example a 224 times 224 image and with the max pooling you down sample it to 112 to times 112 um, image so this is uh, what's typically quite common applied in, in computer vision. They start with a big image and then they downsample it, just keep the max information, the maximum, uh, what's most important, most relevant, and downsample it to smaller spaces. Uh, you can also apply it here in, in NLP, that you, for example, only take, okay, what, what is the maximum of these two numbers? And what is the maximum of these two numbers? Um, but that's not so common. Typically we go max over time, so we take all of the input and see what's the maximum value in the input. <coughs> okay. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty much what I explained. So max pooling uh, with two times two filters would create a variable sized output. So when you have variable sized input, you get variable sized output, which is not so nice for NLP. So mainly also reason to use max over time. And a lot of literature is on max pooling from computer vision. So they introduce also a lot of new concepts and don't confuse max pooling with max pooling over time. And also sadly most libraries like Lasagna and Keras are optimized for computer vision and only support window sized max pooling and not directly implement max over time. So you, when you use it, you need to implement max over time by yourself, uh, which is quite easy using Tiano. So in Tiano, you just say, okay, take the max T for tensor, take the maximum value of your matrix where you have all the activations, all the values, and you say along which axis, so should it go along Y axis, X axis, or Z axis, and then you get the max over time. So this is quite easy to implement using Tiano. Okay, so how would it look like in a complete network? So you have your sentence and you want to say, is the sentence positive or negative? So for every word, every target word, you create your window with the word to the left and the word to the right. You compute the output, the activation of it. Then you compute the max. So in this case, it would be 0.9. And then you just use, for example, a softmax classifier um, to get like negative or positive output. And you can train it like any other neural network. So just use stochastic gradient descent, for example, and backpropagation, and you can, can train it from the uh, begin to the end. You look puzzled, Eva? Are you ordering the max? Uh, good question. <coughs> hmm? So any ideas how you can derive the max? So the derivative of the max is just like the derivative of OI where it applies and for all other it's zero. So it's, uh, and luckily it's already implemented in Tiano, 
uh, so you don't need to take care of that. <laughs> okay. So, um, but with only a single filter, the possibilities are quite limited. So, for example, you have the sentence, the movie was horrible, and you get values like this from your convolutional stage, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, and then minus 0.2 and minus 0.9, and then you apply the max, and you get 0.5 as an output from the beginning, and 0.5 and 0.9, yeah, it's still really good value, reasonable value. And what could be, what could you do to fix this problem that it also cannot only detect like, okay, the movie was awesome, but also can detect the movie was horrible. How could you solve it? Any ideas? Oh, that's fine. I mean, 0 0.5 and 0 0.9 is okay. -ish. Yeah, it's okay, -ish, but. I mean, here you, you see it's not really capturing the information, okay, in the sentence there was horrible. So it just sees, okay, there was no strong positive word, but it does not capture the information there's a strong negative word, applying negativity. Give more for the difference? Sorry? Give more for the difference? Total adjective? Give more for the priority. No, I don't get it, what you mean? So. Mm -hmm. so you more to yeah, but, but how do you do this in this construction? I mean, here it looks at the maximum value and it's 0 0.5, and 0.5 derives from the movie. But how do you give more priority to horrible? Yeah, Maxine? Mm -hmm. Take minimum absolute. <laughs> Like absolute, so yeah, you could also apply min pooling, uh, but we will solve it with max pooling. Yes. Static. Yeah, good, good, on a good way. Ivan, you want to say something? Okay, you could use like larger window size, but larger window size always increases the number of parameters, and when you increase the number of parameters, you also need to increase the number of training data you have, and that's quite hard. So, answer is really simple. We do not compute just a single output, but we compute two outputs. So, first one could be understood as like, okay, is there a positive word in it? And the, neg uh, the second row could be understood as, is there some negative, uh, some negativity in it? And then we compute like, so we here we have like two different weight matrices, for example, or we weight matrix is then not like, uh, so before it was one row, six columns. Now it's uh, two rows, six columns. So our output is like two dimensional vector. And here we see, okay, here we still have 0.5 at the max, but here our negative or negativity detector triggers at horrible and says, okay, here I have a really high negativity detector and then you have two output values, two max values, 0.5 and 0.8, and your softmax classifier can then afterwards detect, okay, should it be like more negative or more positive? How should I understand these two numbers? Emily? So would you have n, n vectors for n classes? Mm, no. Um, so in general, what you do is you, you depend a bit on how large are your board embeddings. So typically word embedding sizes are either 100 dimensional or 300 dimensional. So in the convolutional layer you would go like to something up to 300. You could go maybe reduce the size. Two. Hmm? Two. Here we have two. But in a real scenario this would be like for example 100 dimension and here you could either go also with 100 dimension or you could go to 50 dimension, for example. But typically, I would set this higher than like the number of uh, classes you have. So okay, with because with the example you were saying, okay, well, the, 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 the negative 0.9 kind of would be, uh, how much does the horrible you know, associate with positive, and the negative would be how much does horrible associate with negative. But Correct. actually, usually you would have many more. 
Cor correct. Usually if you have many more, and usually you're not really able to understand or to see direct properties. So it will somehow figure it out, okay, what's useful to detect something positive, what's useful to detect something negative. And when you have more layers, you can encode more complex information. So for example, it contains some negative aspects, but a lot of positive aspects. And when you have like more information in it, you can encode it in there. Good question. Further question? Just to make sure, so it was uh, the, the W matrix was 6 to, right, 6 to 1? Correct. Uh, 6 to 2, because the 6 is like concatenated embedding. So in like Correct. real world scenario, it would be uh, 300 times 3, or like, well, if you're yeah, embedding yeah. To 300, it would be like 900 to, to 2. Correct. Okay. So. So you have two-dimensional embeddings. When you have 300-dimensional embeddings and you concatenate three of them, three words, you have like 100-dimensional as an input, and then you select the number of filters. Let's say you want to reduce it to 100 dimension. So your weight matrix W would be 100 times 900 in size. Because you can see there's a matrix here as well. And it's like from anything from your yeah. It's like each row would be like embedding, which is not like one, one vector. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Uh, yes. So the, the W matrix, the, the number of rows is between one and the maximum number of embeddings. We have. Mm -hmm. of we have one, mm -hmm. the 300 um, vector for embedding, so the weight matrix will be between one or um, 300 dimensions. It can also be larger. So you could also say here you have like 300 dimensional embeddings so and you take three words so you have like 900 dimensional window and you could say I, I don't know I like the number 10,000 and you increase it to 10,000. Okay, so it's, it's independent. And of course uh, the sizes, okay, how, how large are your word embeddings, how large is your convolutional layer it depends on your task. So for simple tasks, you can use small numbers, like small dimensions. For complex tasks, really linguistic complex tasks, you can or need more information, more dimension for that. So there's no rule of thumb. Should be like, I don't know, for some cases, uh, 25 are sufficient, like 25 dimensional. For others, you use like 300 dimensions. So it really dep depends on the task. other questions on that? So basically you go here from left to right, compute your um, compute these values, these vectors, then you do a max and then you have one fixed sized uh, fixed sized vector and then you can do whatever you want with this fixed sized vector. You can feed it into a feed forward network for example or in some recursive network or whatever and just derive, I don't know, your, your class from it or whatever you like. So what you do up here, uh, you can do whatever you want. So this is just an approach to get a variable sized input to a fixed sized uh, vector. Of course, you can make it more complex and you can go further with the convolutional layers and the filters. Um, so we can create different convolutional layers working on unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, and so on, and you can combine the output. So here, the convolutional layer works only on a single word, on a target word. You compute the, the convolutional layer and the max, and you do it with like a window size of three. So here you have the center word, the target word, and one context word to the left and one context word to the right. Compute, compute your convolutional layer, compute the max over time, and then you have like two input vectors which you feed into your classifier, and the classifier derives some output. And you can, of course, increase it to whatever you want. So if you think there are different possibilities and different things which make sense, um, you can implement it here. But typically, uh, people or in the Kim paper, uh, you do not spend so much time on the different sizes, so they implement a uni maybe a unigram and a trigram convolutional layer, 
and just feed it into the uh, into the network. What you can also do is work on different granularity, for example. So here we have um, a layer on convolution layer on character trigrams. So without spaces, so the so you have some embeddings for the trigram the and move and ie and was and her and rip and li and you compute your convolution layer and then you have a convolution la layer on word trigrams maybe pre-trained with word embeddings from word to vec or from glove you compute your max over time and you feed it into your classifier and then you can use um, character information and also word information for example which could be quite useful for example when you have uh, a lot of noisy data maybe from Twitter and where you have strange hashtags which you have never seen before and working on character trigrams or foregrams or, or five grams could help you in this case. Yes, question. Um, how do I choose the vector for the patterns? Mm -hmm. So they seem a bit arbitrary. <coughs> so you the pattern you initialize randomly and yeah. yeah sometimes it's also just set to null. Correct. Sometimes it's set to null. You can set it to null, for example. Good point. Valid point. So you can set it to null. That's also quite common. Then it would be like when it's set to zero, uh, there would be like no link here and no link there. Uh, when you initialize them randomly, you can also update them during training and see, okay, what is the information that the word is at the beginning or at the end is important. You can distinguish between a start padding, so a padding which is in the start of the sentence and a padding which is in the end of the sentence. When it's important, okay, is the word at the beginning of the sentence or at the end of the sentence. I make sure that the vector for the padding does not correspond to any Mm -hmm. uh, when you update the train, uh, the padding vector, it's not important. <laughs> when you don't update it, it's also not important. Um, because, for example, let's say you have 100 dimensional um, vectors for word embeddings, and you draw them at random, it's like really unlikely that they correspond to any word. Because your, your space is so big and it will differentiate at some point. So I would not care about that. So in theory, it should not be equal to some other word, but the probability is so low, you can ignore that. <coughs> One question, how, how, yeah. how do you update the, the weights in the, in the W matrix? So it's a shared parameter. So you compute the gradients for the whole batch and then take a mean or? Mm, no, I mean, so what you do is, so you compute this, you have your forward pairs, pass, mm -hmm. Let's go to the simpler one. You have the, your forward pass, and then it outputs, I don't know, the who movie was horrible is classified as positive. You see, okay, there's an arrow, and then you do the backpropagation, and you see, okay, what was what influenced this. So the point 0.5 came from here. So you update your, your weight matrix here, and you see the point 0.8 was, came from here, so you update your weight matrix, which causes the point eight here. And you do the update of the weight matrix. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. does it answer it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so as mentioned, if you implement it in, I don't know, in Java or in C or in MATLAB, um, you still need to keep a lot of information into your mind uh, how to implement it which is also nice about Tiano that it already implements this. Okay, how do I do compute the gradient when I have like max operations and share parameters between different operations and what's the correct gradient for that? What you can also do is uh, you can stack convolutional layers. So for example, uh, you have strange uh, Twitter tags and you have no sensible word embeddings or no sensible embeddings on a token level but so what you do is you break it down to tokens so you can see okay Star Wars is one token, awesome movie is a different token 
and then you can break it down to trigrams, character trigrams. You have your randomly initialized embeddings, for example, for trigrams. You compute your convolutional layer on the trigrams per token and do the max pooling. So you get here some max value. You do it for the next token, so awesome movie. You break it down to trigrams, compute your convolutional layer here, do the max over time on the token level, and then you have like you have two tokens and you have two embeddings per token, or you have for every token one embedding, fixed size embedding, and then you can decide what you want to do. Uh, you can either input these two to a network or you can do a convolutional layer over all tokens and then you get one vector for the complete sentence which only consisted of strange Twitter hashtags. And then do classification or whatever you want to do on that. questions on that. So I hope you see there are a lot, a lot of different possibilities what you can do and how to apply them and how to stack them. Uh, so convolutional and max pooling is quite powerful tool but as it's typically was quite powerful tools you when you start you have often no idea how to start it. Should I implement it like this or should I implement it other way? So it's good to look at like existing implementations or papers, how they use convolutional neural networks. And as soon as you're an expert in it, you can also think of for different tasks, how could I change my convolutional neural network to, to fit better to my task. So how do stack convolutional layers look like? So here we have our quite familiar image, um, also shown in the last presentations. And here we have our small windows. So in in NLP, we only typically go over like context window, a uh, context window of like three. So one word to the left, one word to the right. Here we take like a two-dimensional uh, window in computer vision, and this window scans over the different patches of the image. So it goes from the left upper left corner to the down right corner. And for each patch, we have like our filter and the filter outputs like different things. So we have like, I think these are 12 times 2, 24 different filter outputs. So these would be like 24 dimensional output and they learn different things. So here it's an edge detector. So this one detects is, is an edge and then you stack it. So you have your small patches and you stack them with a convolution layer to the next layer where you have like can capture input from larger patches. Here it detects an eye, a nose, and so on. And then you stack them in another convolution and max layer to even larger output image where you can recognize, for example, faces. So this is like would be a uh, stack three or three layer convolutional and max uh, approach. Not so common in, computer, uh, in NLP, but quite common in computer vision. Is yes, pooling layer involved here, right? mm. Typically, there is a pooling layer involved. So you 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 do some downsampling. So, for example, this would be like the output for your first edge detector or for your first filter, and then you do mm, pooling layer over two times two, giving you. Okay, and then I use these uh, these result patches. Correct, then you use so these res Correct, then you have, so this is like your first layer working directly on the pixels. Then you have your max pooling giving you these patches and then you use these patches, you stack them to, so you, you take also patches from other directions and you do another convolutional and another max pooling over them until you derive at the end some label. Can I see on the picture a car, a horse, cat, and so on. Good question. Okay, some terminology. So there's the filter length, or what you find on a lot of implementation and also in Keras is the filter length. So how big should be the window? Um, so um, 
you have filter length one would be work on like only the single word, filter length three would also take the word to the left and the word to the right into context. Um, in computer vision, we work may sh uh, main work on spatial close pixels. So it would, when you do image recognition, for example, would not really make sense to take the uh, pixel in the left upper left corner and then down right corner and try to compute anything on that. But in NLP, we are more flexible. So different approaches we could use is to use a context window, which is the most simple word, so where to the left, where to the right. But we could also use dependency links and syntax tree. So maybe you run a parser, get a, a syntax tree, and then you compute your convolutional um, operation on the different links in your syntax tree. And for every link, you get an output, like in every an output like this and then you do your max over time to get one fixed size dense vector and then you capture the information in your syntax tree also in your convolutional layer so it's up to you what's like more useful and more sensible to the task then there is stride which you could understand as okay like step size and um, so should we go like start at the first word, then move to the next word, and then to the next word. But we could also say we want to skip words, so when we select stride as two, we say here the is the target word, the center word, and then we go with like step size two, and then we say was is another center word, and compute our uh, convolution or our filter on it. Um, in NLP, we usually use stride equals one, so I would not see any particular meaning for reason why we should skip some some words. But in computer vision, you can also use other values because you can either say the windows should overlap. So here they overlap. Here they do not overlap or overlap only at the single word. So if you select stride three, for example, would not overlap at all. So just. And also, as mentioned in Keras and Lasagne, it's more targeted for computer vision. When you open the documentation, you find a lot of information on filter lengths, stride, and so on. Then the final point is um, how should we choose the embeddings? And the paper by Kim, um, he, he tested different approaches. So the first approach is with a random initialization. So he just said for every word, he'd selected randomly a dense vector and then updated these vectors during training time, giving quite okay results. Second approach was with a static. Um, so he used word to vec to do some, to do the right uh, word embeddings and then kept them static, not updating them during uh, training time, improving the results. So for example, for the movie review set, goes from 76 to 81, so increasement of 5% F measure, which is quite nice. Then he applied the non-static variation where he first trained word embeddings with word to vec and then updated them during the during training. And then he also proposed a multi-channel approach, which is quite nice idea, but the results are mixed. So sometimes the non-static results are better sometimes the multi-channel approach. So here we have like the non-static approach is better, superior. Here we have the multi-channel approach is superior. But this is the multi-channel idea is quite novel idea. And uh, it's unclear if it will be like one standard really, or one standard way in the future, like dropout, which is applied in every application. So what are what is the multi-channel idea? So you, you start with two copies of the word vectors, both initialized with word to vec or glove. And one version of them is updated, the other one is static. And you apply the same filters to both channels before you apply the pooling. So the idea is that you have one, one, one channel or word embedding, which is specific for the task. So which is, for example, specific for, uh, for sentiment and you have one channel, one word embeddings, which is more general. So for example, um, for sentiment, good and bad should be far away in vector space because they mean like really opposite meanings. But when you use word to vec or glove, 
uh, good and bad would be like quite close in your embeddings. So far, mixed results. Um, what you could also try is to use differently pre-trained word embeddings. So for example, you have one channel with based on local context, one channel based on dependency trace, trees, and the third channel based on knowledge bases. And then you can incorporate different information into your um, into your convolutional network and also say, okay, I want to update this and this uh, channel, but keep the other static. But as mentioned, so far mixed results. So before you really dig into this direction, just get, I don't know, this more simple non-static or static approach running. And yeah, before you try any fancy new stuff. Okay, uh, final questions on channel, multi-channel idea? Christian? Isn't it very harmful to update the version Especially if mm -hmm. your training data is very limited um, in comparison to how the word embeddings have been produced. Mm -hmm. So there's always a positive and a negative side when you update the word embeddings, which applies to all network structures. So it's always a question, should you update the word embeddings or not? The advantage of updating it is that you can learn embeddings which are really specific for the task. So for example, when you get word embeddings uh, from word to vec, bad and good would be really close in vector space because they can appear in a really similar context. And this is quite bad or quite hard for the classifier when bad and good are really close in context space and uh, in, in vector space. The negative side when you update word embeddings is that it can overfit. So that it moves words away and also especially that words which are um, which are, have been closed before in the general vector space are not also not moved away. So this can be a negative point. And when you have small training data, I would not update the word embeddings. When you have like really large training data and especially when your training data covers nearly all the words in your test data, then I would update them. Further questions? Okay, some hints on the implementation. So I think the theory on convolutional neural networks is quite, or fairly easy. I hope it's fairly easy. Or, um, but there are some problems with the implementation. So NumPy and Teano, they cannot work with variable sized rows. So uh, they can only work like with matrices and a matrix has like fixed number of rows and fixed number of columns so it's like I don't know like 20 times 40 matrix and we cannot store information like this is my first sentence and this is my second longer sentence and then super short uh, we cannot implement this as a like fixed matrix there are two approaches to do this to tackle this first of all we ignore the mini batch we just input one sentence at a time for training and testing. So we would here create one, uh, one, one matrix, which is like one row and like six columns. And then the next one is again one row and I don't know, eight, eight columns and then one row and two columns. But this is quite bad for per performance uh, because we, we input always new um, new matrices into it and we cannot use like the really efficient averaging over different mini batches. Different approach. So, sorry, just to make yeah. sure, but you're, you're, not, you're not having a, for one sentence, you're not having like six or seven uh, vector size, but you concatenate embeddings. Right? Yeah. So it's like seven, but it's like seven times hundred or so. Just to make sure, I'm, I don't know. Correct. So what you typically do has in the first instance when as an input you input the index in the vocabulary. So you say this is word 83, this word is 15, word 90, word 21 and so on. And then you have like an integer matrix as an input and Tiano and your network do the lookup into your matrix, into your embeddings matrix. 
So a second approach is to pad sentence with zeros to make them of the same length. Um, so you just look into it, okay, what is the longest sentence here? So the second sentence is the longest, which is of length one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you just pad every other sentence to the length of eight, adding zero. So zero padding at the end. Uh, you could also repeat the same sentence. You should be careful with the padding that the max pooling does not choose your padded values as the max value, which would be quite bad. So when you pad it to, I don't know, to something, and then the max pooling selects always your padding as the max value, which is, which is not so nice. Also, yes? this when you do zero padding for example you have your word indices like this is word 5, word 9, word 7 and then you say this is word 0, 0, 0 okay. and you do some mapping I don't know this is 0 0.7 3. so what you do need to do is also map these so I would recommend that you map them to zeros. Is there any good options, right? Is that something to start with? Yeah, that's the question how you implement it. Um, that's a question how you implement it. I will come to it okay, okay. later in the next step. So here you have your embeddings. And then you do your front layer, so this is embeddings, then you have your convolution layer, which I don't know, point nine. And your convolution layer is like W times, I don't know, your vector whatever you say, vector 1, vector 2, vector 3, for example. Mm -hmm. And when these are 0, you get an output of 0 also here. So when you multiply your weight matrix times 0, the output will also be 0. So you can ensure that this is... Then you do your max over time. And you know, okay, this is zero as an output. And when you know, okay, when here is at least one positive number, uh, it will not choose the padding. So when it will choose, for example, 0.9 and 0.8 as an output. So what could happen here, or what could go wrong, for example, is you compute this you apply some activation function and you always get here a negative and then your output would be like zero, zero. So because it will look here, okay, okay, the maximum value is point zero, and it will choose the maximum value here. And what you can do, for example, ensure is how you select the activation function. So when you use the rectifier linear unit, which is the maxi maximum between zero and x, you know, okay, these cannot be smaller than zero. Also the same when you use the sigmoid function. Or you can just hope that here are some positive numbers in between. So that's pretty much the, the only situation you do that into when you're doing zero padding? Correct. So it could be when you do zero padding and your implementation contains some flaws, that it will also just select this information as the output for the max which is not so nice, and also you could, depending on your implementation, also update them, and then your 
implementation would just learn, okay, what's happening on the padding. Okay, but you don't, you don't want to be updating your zeros. No. Right. I, I, mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just curious, would, would that be you do not know which one was selected. So you do not know, okay, this one was selected or this one was selected. So okay. here it cannot have or does not have the information about the sentence length. So when sentence length is an important information, or also when the position is important, where does this work occur? So maybe it's more important that it's in the beginning, you need to input it as an input as a feature into your network. Also, when you do the zero padding, be careful with the runtime because a single super long sentence does not create. Uh, so, when you have one super long sentence, I don't know your sentence all length five, and then you have one sentence with length one thousand. You do like nine hundred ninety-five paddings for every sentence, which gives you like a really large training matrix, which could be hard for your memory to handle it, and also could be. Um, could be bad for for your con for your performance because then you compute a lot of convolutional operations on the padding on the zero padding, which is quite waste of time. Um, but this zero padding is great to run on GPU. So on a GPU, you have, can run I don't know five thousand parallel threads and more, and all these operations here you can execute them in parallel. So there's no need to run them in a sequence. You can run them in a parallel. And there, when you run it on a GPU, it does not really depend uh, if you do the padding or not. So because, I don't know, when you run it, when you have 1,000 or when you run 5,000 in parallel and 5,000 cores, a GPU has, it does not care if you waste just 4,000 cores to run, uh, to compute the zero padding for it. And on a CPU, when you typically has one core, maybe four cores or whatever, uh, you should be careful with that. Some more hints on the implementation. Most implementations for convolutional layers are targeted for computer vision. So where you have, we have some filter lengths and so on, and where the convolutional layers is on, on three or uh, on two dimensional images or on three dimensional images when you include the color. And they introduce a lot of hyperparameters. So there is an implementation in Keras convolutional one dimension, 1D, where we have different parameters, MB filters for dimensionality of the output. So should we map it to like two dimensions in our examples here, or should we map it to 50 dimensions? We have the filter lengths, um, which is the extension of each filter, so should it only look at a single word, should it look at three words, at five words, at ten words. We have information on the border mode, so how should it, should words handled on the border, so in the beginning of the sentence and, and the end of the sentence. So for computer vision, it can make a difference if you should include pixel information in the border, should it include it or should it not, should the filter be wrapped around so that the word at the, or the pixel at the end of an image is concatenated with the pixels at the beginning of an image. And we have the subsample length, which is like the strike value for the filter. So should it go one word to the next or should it like compute it on every second, every third word. And then we have also the Keras max pooling 1D. Um, be careful, max pooling 1D is not the max over time, which is always used in NLP, but which is like this fixed size window. And um, there we have like pool lengths. So where we do the downscaling of it, uh, we have the stride value and we can say, do we want to ignore the borders or not? <coughs> uh, 
And as mentioned, convolutional 1D and max pooling 1D is not suitable for max over time implementation, which is quite sad. But I tried to implement a max over time on Friday. And so this is highly quick and dirty implementation with no testing, no warranty, but it produ produces some sensible output. And I copied the, all the boilerplate from the dense layer, which is all here, where we say, okay, we have some initialization function. How do we initialize our, our, our matrix? What's the activation function? What is the output dimensions? Do we have regularization on the weight matrix, B matrix? Do we have constraint and so on? And then we have a lot of builds, so I all copied it. And what I programmed by myself are like these lines. Uh, so which also shows that Tiano is quite powerful, but also takes some time to understand. So we have some our input. So this is the input to the convolutional layer. Then we compute the dot product between X and the weight matrix. And then we do the max over time. So we compute the max of the output along X is one. So here we say we assume three dimensional input. So we have one dimension for the mini batches, second dimension for the convolution. So for example, the sentence and the third dimension are the embeddings. And then we add the bias vector, and at the end we do the activation. So what you also see here is like a simplification. So we just first compute uh, x times w, then do the max, then add the bias vector, then do the activation, which is a bit different than here where we first computed w times the input vector, added the bias vector, computed the activation function, then did the max. So this is some mathematical simplification because uh, you can move the activation function and apply it to C and also add the B bias vector to the C because it does not change. So these are all like linear monotone functions, uh, which uh, saves you some computation power because you do not need to compute the activation function for each convolutional output here, yeah. So this is your, your output, or this is like everything you need to implement. And if you want to, to use it, there's already the IMDB uh, data set in Kevas. So it's from movie reviews, positive movie review, negative movie review. We can load it, so we get an X-train, Y-train, X-test, and Y-test. So how does it look like? So this is like different words. Um, they have already the word index. So one is the most common word. It's probably the, and then the 20 most common words. So this is how it's stored in the data set. And then we can see the labels. So one is, I don't know, negative or positive, and, or one is positive, zero is negative. And here we can really simply implement our uh, convolutional network with max over time. So what we first need is to do the padding. And then we say, okay, what's the maximum length we want to pad to? So we, in this case, we say long documents, long reviews are, uh, are cut off. And shorter documents, shorter reviews are padded with zeros. So we have our max length. So here we take 200 words as the maximum length, uh, which is also a parameter you can play around if you should choose like the first 200 words, the last 200 words, whatever it's suitable for your task. And you could also, of course, set it to like the maximum length of your in your training data. We do the same with um, with y test. Um, so uh, x, sorry, x test. 
with the test matrix. So we now have our fixed sized uh, matrices. And then we say it's a sequential model. And how do I proceed? So what would be like the next lines to implement? Any ideas on it, what we need next? So now we have our matrix um, having the different documents and having the different words in the documents. What would be the next layer to implement? Convolution? Not yet. Sorry, second. Correct. So the first one is n embedding. So we say model add. We have already implemented the embedding in in Akeras. That's features. So we say this is um, the output dimension we like to have, or this is, oh sorry, this is the size of our vocabulary. So we use max uh, 5,000, or well, the vocabulary is 5,000, so the 5,000 most common words. The embeddings have size 100, and the maximum input length is equals max length, so it's 200. Now we have mapped our 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 uh, words, our word indices to some embeddings. What would be the next layer we could add? Multiplication by Yes, we could add the convolutional layer, but one step before. What what's good trick on it? So it's not one wrong, but there's one nice trick from last week how to improve what how to avoid overfitting and how to improve your accuracy. Drop Correct. Anyone? So we could add a dropout, which we select randomly at point uh, twenty-five. Uh, you could also select a dropout of uh, zero point five. And then we do the mm, conf layer plus max over time. So model at So we have our dropout, then we have our convolutional with max over time layer, which is implemented here, where we say, okay, the filter, the number of filters is equals here. So we set 100 filters. And as activation function, we use the rectifier linear unit. And what could we do? So can you reduce the number of filters again? Um, the number of filters is this. So we, we take the words here and map it to 100 dimension here. Okay, then we have our convolutional with max over time layer. What would be the next layer? Softmax. Soft How do you implement a softmax? Yeah, there is a function. What's the name of the function? How do I get a softmax classifier? Any ideas? So what's a softmax? No, no. No. So a softmax layer is just a dense layer where you use as classification uh, activation softmax. 
So our output, so number of classes is one, so positive or negative. And here we use the sigmoid function, which is like the one-dimensional softmax. So softmax is multi-class, sigmoid is only one-dimensional, and we have one output neuron, which case how positive is the review. Zero would be not positive at all. One is it's, it's really highly positive. But it would be good to have to have a hidden layer or to implement a hidden layer of your, your convolutional layer. So here we add dense layer uh, with some hidden units. And as activation, we have the rectifier linear unit. And then you do the another dropout. So a dropout al always helps to prevent overfitting. And then we have our softmax classifier. And then we compile our model. We say as loss function, we have the cross entropy. So we select binary cross entropies, binary because we have zero one values. As optimizer, you can select different functions like stochastic gradient descent, or in this case, the atom optimizer. And class mode, because it's binary, we need to specify the binary mode. And then we j just train our um, model. set the number of no, number of iterations and so on and then we can just train it that's the final implementation and then you see okay it's it's working it's loading the data and giving you quite okay accuracy on this on this case if you train it for three iterations you get like 86% um, accuracy on this task, which you should of course compare like uh, to other classifiers. How good do they perform here? I would say for the EMDB data set, the convolutional layer is not really the right approach because a convolution or a document can contain positive and negative words, and a convolutional layer is not able to count how many positive words, how many negative words are in the review which could be quite crucial to determine is it overall positive or is it's overall negative. And here you see it's training, so it took 30 seconds for one iteration and gives an accuracy of 84% after the first iteration. Okay. Final questions on the implementation part? Yeah, it's, it's indeed quite arbitrarily, so how you select here the model, how you select the dropout, how you select the number of filters. Do you do a cutoff here? So it's due to optimization, so you have some intuition um, on the problem and what you need, but uh, there you typically apply some random search, so you just randomly select values you think could be suitable, train it, test it, and compare it, does it uh, increase the performance or does it not increase the performance and often so some parameters are quite important where you need to know okay these are important others parameter have no no real or no big influence on on your test data so for example and also it depends on the task so for example the filter size here you have a filter size of three it could be important for one task, but it could be uh, not important for the other task. So, for example, when you need to handle negation, 
uh, it could be important to have like a wider filter when it's not important for your task. Uh, you can also go for working on single words, for example. There is one, one question here. Yeah. Uh, the embeddings are here not pre-trained. They are not pre-trained. They are randomly initialized, and uh, it would help, I think, a lot to have pre-trained word embeddings in this case. So as we see here, what's the difference between pre-trained? So this is randomly, and this is pre-trained, and you get like here 5% increase, here you get a 4% increase in F measure just by changing non-pre-trained to pre-trained. Is it the same data set or not? The MR yeah. is not the same. Mm -hmm. so, so they didn't include the IMDB data set, presumably because the results were improved, because this data set is not suitable for the data set, because SMA is going out. Yeah, it's a document, it's like the whole Correct, so convolutional cannot count, cannot take lengths into account, but just looks, identifies like single words, important words, and can also scope with also negation in it. So, for example, I don't know, one filter could learn, okay, this is like not, and the other one could learn, okay, this is positive word, and the second filter dimension, and then the your classifier on top can learn, okay, there's a not and there's a positive or negative word in it and how, how should it deal with that. So it's a bit magic what happens in there because it's like really limited model but giving really good results uh, in general on sentence level when you do sentence classification. So what are the typical filters for, for NLP? So you take like one kilogram and trigram and that's it? Or? Um, I would check the Kim paper. Um, I, w I would, yeah, do trigrams. Trigrams may try and fifths, maybe so five words and three words, typically. But depends on your task. So when your task, it depends how important is the context information. So for sentiment, it can be quite important for other tasks. So I don't know. Does it include a celebrity in the text? the context information would be not so important. The window size, we... So this is um, the downside of this implementation. Um, here we don't have, we cannot specify the window size, so it works only on unigrams in this implementation. Uh, what you need to do is to, to change either of this implementation uh, or you need to change your input that you take like two words and merge to one. So for example, two, two embeddings and merge to one embedding. But currently this implementation is not able to do this. There is a convolutional 1D implementation provided by Keras, but which is quite, quite slow. Um, so on GitHub, so on GitHub you find the folder examples, and there you find the EMDB CNN. And here they run um, have an implementation. So I copied the code here and changed it, so copyright to them. And here you find it how it's implemented using Keras. Uh, was using their convolution 1D layer and a max pooling layer with window size 2. But the downside, so they achieve 83% accuracy, not 86% when you do the max over time. And what's an even bigger issue is uh, the runtime. So when I compile it, you will see that the runtime is, is really slow in this case. So here we had like a runtime of like 32 seconds. Uh, 
and here we will see that we have a runtime of I don't know like 500 seconds because how they implemented it and because they're not using max over time but like the max layer was like window size of two. So here we see it's like 400 seconds, 440 seconds for one iteration. But here you could say, what is your filter length? Is it one word, is it trigram, bigram, and so on. Further questions? So in case you're interested into uh, convolutional neural networks, I think it's a really good model, really simple model. And um, you can apply it for a lot of tasks when you're in the domain of like sentence classification or maybe phrase classification. Uh, have a look into the paper from Kim, Performance on Sentence Classification Tasks. There he de describes it in great detail, also how he selected the parameters, what's the filter length, for example. And as you see, you get quite good results, uh, also quite surprising results um, for a lot of different tasks, which are in the field, in the domain of sentence classification. Okay, and thank you very much, and enjoy the convolutional neural networks.